um, and I'm also lucky to be the point of care ultrasound fellow, as I get a lot of time to scan for people. Um, today, I'm just going to share some images and talk about an um, interesting case that I saw recently um, and probably share some learning points that I've taken from this case um, and hope you guys enjoy the images and the case as well. Uh, I'm just going to start off first with just a brief about what happened. Um, so it's just another day in majors where seeing cases and um, one of the SHOs comes to me and says, can you do a bladder scan for this patient? I know you're a focus fellow. We can't find the bladder scanner and you know how to measure it with an ultrasound. So I said, yeah, fine, let's do this. Um, so what's the story? And the story was he's a 60 year old, otherwise fit and healthy person. He's got no comorbidities came in walking to the emergency department because he's not able to pass urine for the last three weeks. Uh, he's been on three different antibiotics for three weeks, but in the last week, he's really struggling. He's been passing small amounts of urine. He's having some incontinence. He's wearing a pad now. Uh, so he just his wife just pushed him to go to the hospital and get it checked. Um, so he said, yeah, okay, but let's, let's get the ultrasound, put the probe and see how much urine he has, whether he's in retention. So this is what we see. Um, is everybody able to see the images on my screen? Yeah, all good, mate. Yeah, good, okay. So this is um, this is the first image. So you put a probe on his um, belly. We expect it to have retention. And this is what we see. Uh, you've got a distended bladder. Uh, you've got some debris at the base. And we're like, okay, he definitely needs a catheter. Um, so we, we end up measuring it and we measure it and it's about 1.5 liters uh, approximately. Um, and we said, okay, fine, we need to put in the catheter. So my SHO goes away, tries to get the catheter trolley ready and we be explaining to the patient what we're going to do. Um, meanwhile, actually we get talking and the patient's wife mentions that the patient's not really himself for the last few weeks. He's normally very active, running around, but he's been very tired, weak. Also has noticed that he's a bit breathless um, and he's complaining of some niggling pain in his tummy, lower abdomen and left side of the groin. So I said, okay, we've got some time, we've got the probe. Um, why don't we just go on looking, clicking some images. Um, so the next thing we do uh, is look at his left thigh. Um, just gonna show you some images of the left thigh. Um, can anybody interpret what's on the image? What, what are we seeing or what are we taking away from this image? There is, uh, I think, a thrombus, maybe a clear thrombus on the, on the artery. Yeah, so... The compressible vein already. Okay, so I'm trying to compress, yeah. Um, there's a Mickey Mouse coming into the picture. Um, so the Mickey Mouse is basically the femoral artery femoral vein and the great saphenous vein. Um, and what we see in this image is actually, I'm trying to compress the vein and the artery to see if it's compressible. Uh, well, but you can see on the right side of the image, uh, here we've got the femoral artery because it's pulsatile, even though I'm compressing it. It's got the femoral vein and you've got the great saphenous vein coming in here. But the femoral artery is compressible, but the femoral vein is not. And actually I can see some echogenic material within the, within the vessel wall. Um, so I was like, okay, this is suspicious for a DVT unless proven otherwise. Um, so I was like, ooh, now I'm a bit worried that it's just not a simple case of retention that I'm gonna put a catheter and he's going to go back home with a 12 clinic follow-up. So they did mention that he was a bit breathless. So I said, okay, fine, we should, we should kind of see a little bit more. Uh, obs wise, he was a bit tachycardic, but he's got 1.5 liters in his um, bladder. So he's, he's a bit distressed as well, but otherwise completely fine. Um, so we went ahead, clicking more pictures, investigating a little bit more, um, and we go to the chest. Uh, so this is what we see, and this is the parastinal long axis view. Um, anyone want to comment on this view? This is the parasitic long axis view. So just, just to remind, this is a 
view where the probe is on the left side of the chest, um, maybe second, third or fourth intercostal space, left side of the sternum, and the probe markers towards the patient's right shoulder. Uh, what, we, what we see in this image is a long axis of the heart. So we're, we're looking at the left atrium here, got the left ventricle, got the aortic valve, um, got the RVOT or the right ventricle and the descending aorta. Um, so looking at this image, um, I felt at that time that this, this part of the right ventricle wasn't moving a lot and possibly it's a bit slightly maybe dilated. So it needs further, further views to assess. So I'm quite worried because he's got a DVT at this point. So I'm actually looking for signs of dilated right ventricle. So we go ahead and do more images. So this is me just turning the probe marker 90 degrees to the uh, patient's left shoulder. So we've got a short axis view uh, of the heart. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I think you wanted to say something. Uh, sorry. So you've got the short axis view. So looking at the same images on the different angle, um, what I can see in this image is this is the LV. This is the RV and we've got some signs of a dilated right ventricle and you've got this D shaping of the left ventricle, um, also known as the D sign. Um, so this is good evidence to suggest that there is some right heart strain and dilated right heart, given the fact that he's got a DVT or a possible DVT. I'm worried about possibly a PE at this point, which can cause RV dilatation. Um, obviously, we've got enough evidence for him to have a CTPA and along with some of the history and some other investigations. Um, but I think it is, at this point, I was like, we, we, he's quite stable. We can do more images and see and get more information from the patient. So went ahead to see the apical four chamber. So this is the apical four chamber. Um, it's not exactly at the apex, but I think I was trying to look more towards the right heart. So I, I'm looking more, it's more like the right heart focused kind of apical four chamber view. Um, again, just going through the image and the chambers. So you've got the left atrium here, uh, got the left ventricle, got the right atrium, and the right ventricle. Um, oh, the most interesting part about this image was where we have the free wall of the right ventricle and you've got this movement of the apex. Um, anybody knows this name of the sign that we, we expect with this image? McConnell sign. McConnell sign, yeah. So everybody knows the McConnell sign. Um, it's a very interesting sign. Uh, it's quite, it used to be thought that it's quite specific for um, PE. Uh, and if you see this, you should be worried that the patient has right heart strain. Um, so that's, that's what we took away from this image. So we've got a patient who mainly came in for retention and now we're talking about McConnell signs, passive PE or big large PEs. It's quite interesting. So this has all happened in about 10, 15 minutes, uh, mainly because of his wife giving more information to us. And so we went ahead and when we are at this view, we also look for certain other signs. Um, so I went ahead and did that. So this is me putting the color, color Doppler uh, through the tricuspid valve. Um, so this is the same apical four chamber view where we have the four chambers, but I'm looking at the tricuspid valve and you can see a regurgitation jet that's coming out, going away from the probe. Um, and we can use this jet. If you've got this jet, we can use it, I think, um, to kind of estimate the systolic pressures in the pulmonary artery or the right ventricular systolic pressures. Um, so usually I put a um, continuous wave Doppler through that uh, jet, exactly through that jet so that you can get this waveform that we see on the left. And we measure the V max, that's the, the maximum velocity. And if you just put it into your system, it gives you some, it does some calculations and it gives yeah. you the right ventricular systolic pressure. So what I'm getting at is I'm trying to see if it's the 60-60 sign is there. Um, so we've got the TR max here in, three, in centimeters per second, but you put that in meters per second into the, into the system and it gives you some numbers. We'll come back to those numbers soon. 
So at this point, yeah, I'm, I'm also trying to see the 60-60 sign. So I'm trying to get the second part of the 60-60 sign, which is the pulmonary axle time. Uh, and this, this is the view of the pulmonary artery. So this is the short axis of the heart. And I'm looking uh, at the aortic valve level. And then I slowly turn the probe towards the right ventricular outflow tract area of the pulmonary artery. And I don't, we don't do this all the time, but because we've got a patient who's making good pictures, we're continuing to see some more signs. Um, and then we see that this is the pulmonary artery here. And we've got something very interesting that's happening in the middle of it. It keeps coming in and out of view, um, which at that time, I think I, I, was, I was thinking in terms of what it could be, which I confirmed later. Anybody can take a guess what that is? In the right pulmonary artery? Pulmonary embolism. Yeah, that's, that's correct. It's just a part of the pulmonary embolism that we are able to see. Um, uh, incidentally, on, on this view, not something that we're looking for, but it turns out that um, later when I spoke to some more senior, more experienced uh, echocardiographers, uh, sonographers, they said, yeah, that was the pulmonary embolism that we were seeing. So quite interesting at that point, we had the diagnosis, but obviously we need to prove it with further definitive imaging. Uh, so yeah, that's the pulmonary artery with the right pulmonary um, embolism in the right pulmonary artery that we could see. Uh, so this guy at this point is like literally a focus atlas, like he's making images everywhere, he's, he's giving you so many signs, and he's telling you what the diagnosis is. So quite interested. So we, we put the pulse wave Doppler through through the pulmonary artery valve, uh, pul pulmonary vein, uh, and we look at we look at these waveforms that are formed, um, and we measure basically the start to the peak of the waveform. And that gives you the pulmonary axle time. So it measures the time taken from the start to the peak of the wave. And it's said that as per the 6060 sign, you can see here the time here is 40, 48 milliseconds. And the right ventricular systolic pressure, which was calculated, was about 45. So it does satisfy the 6060 sign. And what the 6060 sign is, is a very specific sign for acute PEs. Um, and it, it says that the right ventricular systolic pressure that you measure with the tricuspid jet should be less than 60 millimeter. Of, um, and also the pulmonary axle time should be less than 60. And this is because the right ventricle is very thin walled. And when you have an acute obstruction, like a clot, the right ventricular dilates and fails, but it's, it's, there is increase in pressure but it's not very high enough and can't generate high enough pressures like you would see in a chronic pulmonary hypertension patient where the RV has had the time to become more hypertrophy and can generate higher pressures. So at this point, we've got McConnell sign, D sign, 60-60 sign, but calculating all of this in a busy a &E is is not something that I do every day and we don't have the time to do it. Calculations in a sick patient who is either very tachypneic or tachycardic um, and you're not getting good images might not be something that you would want to do on a regular basis and it might not be very accurate. So I was thinking to myself, can, can the waveforms just tell you instead of the calculations, can the waveforms through the pulmonary vein can just tell you some information about the, about the patient? So they do. Uh, so this is just another patient with a normal uh, normal pulmonary arteries. And I'm just doing the same thing again, putting the pulse wave through the pulmonary artery. Uh, and this is what you normally see the morphology of the waveform. So you've got this V-shaped waveform where the peak is somewhere after 120 milliseconds or in the, in the middle. So this is like a normal waveform through the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, but compared to this patient's waveform, which is, you can see in this one is quite pokey and it's got like a W kind of uh, morphology where you've got this W and this notching here. Um, and this is also known as systolic notching of the pulmonary outflow, outflow tract, um, right ventricular outflow tract. Uh, and there have been studies to show that early systolic notching is also a very specific sign for pulmonary embolism. Um, so, it's quite interesting. This is another patient where we couldn't get any other good images, but actually just uh, only 
interpretable image walls of the right ventricular outflow tract. And you can see clearly that there's nice flying W sign or the systolic notching sign in this as well. And this patient also had uh, quite a big thrombus in the pulmonary artery. Uh, there was a paper, uh, I think it came out in 2019. Uh, they, they looked at this particular sign. Um, they looked at whether early systolic notching was comparable or better than the other signs that we normally use in picking up submassive or uh, massive PEs, because these were the patients that you're really worried about. And uh, they found that the sensitivity and specificity was actually better, uh, but they excluded all the chronic pulmonary hypertension patients because it would have been interesting to see whether they, we would be able to use that even in patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension. Um, also, getting these views is not the easiest and it takes time. And we, if you've got the other information, uh, like the D sign, the McConnell sign, whether finding an ESN is of any use. But the way I see it is that if you do see early systolic notching, and you try to look for it. Um, at that point, if you do see it, then you're probably worried about a big clot burden. If you don't see it, you don't rule it out. But at least when you, if you do see it, then you can be prepared so much more uh, in the patient that you, you're worried about having a PE. Um, so in the last few months, I've, I've seen a few patients who've had large clots and they've all had early systolic notching. So I think a lot of work needs to be done in this field, but it's not yet a focus kind of um, a test that we do a bedside, but it could be at some point. Um, this is the CT. So what happened to our patient? Basically, this patient had saddle embolus with quite occlusive pulmonary artery thrombus. Um, patient was admitted, discussed with ITU. I think we got in discussion whether he needs to be thrombolized. Uh, at that point, as per our protocols, we decided because he looks okay, he's fine at the moment, not for thrombolysis and started him on heparin. Um, unfortunately, the patient overnight, I think, in the a &E developed um, Malina. And then uh, I think there was a lot of discussions whether we should stop anticoagulation. Um, and eventually he was moved to um, St. Thomas's, I think, for thrombectomy. Uh, the last I heard that he had an OGD that showed a slow bleeding ulcer, but he had a thrombectomy and he's completely resolved post that and he's been discharged home. So he had a good outcome. Uh, but just the journey of the patient and what, what focus did and helped this patient have like at least expedited his treatment and diagnosis. Was I felt like was very, very interesting and did not something, it was not something that I expected to see in a patient who came in with retention. Uh, they did a lot of study, they did a lot of tests to find possible cause why he developed um, PE, uh, but the current diagnosis uh, with what they've stuck with is possible three weeks of chronic retention cause, causing venous stasis and DVT leading to PE. So yeah, uh, patients with, I mean, Tensions could also be at risk of thromboembolic uh, or BTEs. And I found that very, very interesting. And I'd love to hear what you guys think about it as well. Amazing. Thanks very much for that, Gohol. Such a fantastic case. Uh, the first question from the chat uh, was about why, in the first place, you went delving into the groin to look for a DVT. What was it that made you think about that? So, uh, so the the, so basically the patient was on my right and the, um, the wife was on the left and the patient kept saying, no, I'm fine. Just the urine doesn't come out. And the patient's wife actually was picking up on all the small things that he's been complaining at home. So the one thing that she said was he slept in an armchair for about uh, three days ago. And since then he's been, he's been taking some ibuprofen and some naproxen because he's got pain in his legs. There was no swelling, but there was some pain. So just, just for that, we thought like, maybe just have a look. Um, I wasn't fully at that time thinking about DVT, uh, but because he was not moving, she says he was not, he was not being his normal self, not being, he's been very tired, not walking around. I thought there's possibility of it, um, but it wasn't really on high of my list. So we just thought we'd just look and see what we find. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I guess in terms of just the general approach to PE with ultrasound, um, I mean, there's some fantastic images there. Uh, I guess if you've got a young patient who doesn't have any lung disease, who has a good story for PE and you see just basic RV dilation or septal flattening, which is pretty easy for us all to pick up, then you know, that's already enough to make a diagnosis of PE because there's no other reason the, the RV should be dilated. But I guess in the, in the group of older patients, maybe with some lung disease, where it could well be chronic RV dilation, maybe from chronic pulmonary hypertension, for example, if they have COPD, then in that group, it's obviously more tricky to try and make a diagnosis of PE with bedside ultrasound. So I think, yeah, probably the next step is to look for a DVT, because if you see a DVT, that's confirmed the diagnosis as, as you did. So basically, I think as soon as you'd seen that DVT and then uh, gone up to the heart and saw signs of PE, that probably already confirmed it, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think for the majority of patients, that's gonna be your bread and butter. But yeah, I think the early systolic notching thing sounds uh, sounds very interesting. Sounds like it's uh, definitely a promising tool that might be useful in a sort of a minority of patients. Has anyone else in the audience got experience with using it? Professor Harris or Anna or anyone else? Yeah, I, I, I read those papers and I thought, oh, this is great. But to, to me, I found the clinical context in which I was performing the echo made the decision to a point where I didn't need the added certainty of the added imaging. I, I take on board in this case, this was an unexpected finding when the time course was difficult um, and I can see how it could have done. I, I, I do have a question. Um, I'd understood that using the 60-60 was a, a good way of looking at acute versus chronic. And I guess the only time I have used it is when I've got someone with chronic lung disease and I've been trying to see if there's a P on top of the chronic lung disease. Um, although often those people have had an echo and I've been able to look at their um, TR jet and the TR pressures and I've made the decision, is there an acute increase in the pressures that is most likely to represent a PE? Because it's pretty unusual to see those pressures go shooting up just with an infective exacerbation or anything else. Um, however, where I am, the number of people with chronic lung disease is reasonably small. Most of our population is young. So... Uh, I, I, I did use it, but I've, I've not found that it added a great deal. And I think the advantage of us as clinicians is that we've got that clinical context. And so we approach the scan with a, a, a likelihood ratio, I guess. And for me, that's been sufficient to make the decision. Hmm. Well, thank you. But I, I very much welcome other people. I mean, what do you do? Do you use it? Um, I mean, I've used it just a few times. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I can't always find that view on every patient, um, especially as, as Gokul was saying, especially if they're sort of you know, unwell, sometimes it's, it's difficult to even find the view. Um, I think it's definitely something good to be aware of, um, but I much more often we'll use uh, things like the presence of the DVT uh, and also lung ultrasound. Uh, so if they've got normal lung ultrasound, a dilated RV and a, and a sign of a dvt you know that's i'd just stop there um but yeah i think it's certainly something good to be aware of and potentially has a role how about I you think measuring you anything sorry uh, I, I, mean, I think measuring anything in an emergency department where it's sometimes busy hectic patients are unwell you're not getting the perfect images is always going to have a margin of error um so to i don't really rely on it like just on those measurements at all. Uh, but I've, what, what I was trying to get at is whether just looking at the waveform can give you information rather than you taking time to measure and doing 60-60 uh, was interesting. Maybe maybe not just the early systolic sign, just the waveform that you're seeing. You're seeing a notch, you're seeing something. You know that there's something, some resistance down downstream. So those measurements were um, routine measurements that we did on all our RV patients in the echo lab. So we did it a lot. And then as soon as I came back to a and &E, I barely used it and then stopped using it completely. But having said that, I think if you've got the time and you've got a suitable patient, why not do it um, to you know learn the skills on those patients and see where it might be useful for those days where you're, you've got a bit of a clinical conundrum that could be really helpful. Um, so I don't use it much, but I can if you've got the time for it, great. Why not? 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's a great point. Yeah, if there's a if there's a beautiful window of the pulmonary artery coming down there, uh, as you say, got all qualitative uh, qualitative measurements probably more useful for an ED context rather than quantitative. So yeah, if you can get a quick waveform and see the big notch, yeah, I think that's that's a useful thing to look for. Cool. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on to the next section? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, Goku, um, um, you made an image of the pulmonary artery as well. Um, yeah. Is that is that something we should be doing in every patient uh, whom we suspect of having pulmonary embolism? I wouldn't say so, no. <laughs> uh, it depends on what like, pulmonary artery, I mean, it depends on what you're actually looking for. If you're able to see it, like Anna said, if you've got the time, and you're, you're able to see if somebody is making good images, you think you can get the image, possibly yes. Uh, but if not, uh, you've got like five or six signs. If you can't get the first two, maybe try the third one. If you can't get the first two, three that you normally rely on, maybe try the fourth one. But spending more and more time on it, probably not the best way to go, I think. Uh, I'm not sure what others feel about it. And, and then the, and the, the follow-up question, if you... Um... If you do not see any D-shaping or uh, other signs of enlargement of the, of the right ventricle, can there still be a significant cellular embolus over there? So as per the paper, I think everybody who had ESN, uh, early systolic notching, did have all the other signs as well. So all of, they took 277 patients and they, I think 48 to 49% were massive and submassive PEs the ones that have big clot burden with right heart strain. Uh, so everyone who had early systolic notching did have McConnell's, did have 60-60, did have D-sign. So I don't think so. If you don't see the D-sign, McConnell sign, you can't rule out a PE, uh, but it, looking at early systolic notching might not add anything to that. So you could still have PE, but maybe not like right heart strain. So you might rely, you want to, might, want to rely on investigations like troponin B and B and other things as well to make that and the CTPA to make that call. Yeah, of course you could have a completely normal echo and still have a PE. Yeah. yeah. And really our bread and butter is is looking for our, you know, the visual assessment, our, our D shape deformation, the, the, the bit of septal bounce that you get to start with, the enlarging of the right ventricle. So those are the bits we look out for. Everything else is a bit academic and probably um, more obviously abnormal beyond those initial findings. So um, I would go with the, the visual assessments. Great. Uh, yeah, if there's any other questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. We might move on to the next section now, uh, which is quite experimental. Uh, so I've prepared for you guys uh, a little quiz uh, on using a completely new platform that I've never used before. So it could be a complete disaster, but hopefully that'll add to some of the excitement of the quiz itself. Uh, normally I use things like Mentimeter and Kahoot, uh, but this time I've prepared a uh, Jeopardy game show style quiz for you. So if you bear with me while I just set it up. Okay. So can you all see that? Okay. Hopefully you can just see the Jeopardy board. So for, the, for those of you who don't, uh, haven't seen Jeopardy, uh, it's a game show and we'll have two teams. Uh, you can choose uh, one of the five topics, physics, abdomen, thorax, heart, or procedural. And you can also choose how much money you want to go for on each turn. So $100 questions are quite easy. $500 questions are quite hard. So, you know, if you want to play it safe, you go for a smaller amount, you get the idea. Uh, so we'll have two teams and to, to group you into teams, uh, I'd like you all to write into the chat uh, whether you prefer dogs or cats. So are you a dog person or a cat person? So if you could all write that in the chat and then we'll have two groups, which will obviously be dogs versus cats. Okay, and I'm just going to randomly choose captains for each group as well. Uh, and so when it's when it's your team's turn, uh, you can give advice to your captain, either talking or through the chat, and then the captain will make the final decision for your team. Okay, so 
let's see, it's quite a good spread of cats versus dogs. Maybe a few more dogs than cats. Okay, so for the captain of the cat team, are you there, Varun? Oh, yes, I'm here. I'm yeah. Here. Would you mind popping your video on if you're happy? To, are you happy to be the captain of the cats team? Oh, yes. Uh, my video doesn't work. I'm really sorry. Okay. Oh, no worries. That's okay. You happy to be the captain? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you, mate. And then for the captain of the dog team, are you there, Dev? Yep, I'm there. Sorry, mate. That's all right. No worries. Uh, would you like to be captain of the dogs team? Um, I would give that a pass because I'm, I'm, I'm doing something at this height too. So. Oh, yeah, no worries. That's okay. Any other volunteers to captain the dog team? Perhaps Trang, are you there? Yep, I could carry the mental. Okay, thank you, Trang. Okay, so we have Trang as captain of dogs and Varun as captain of the cats. Okay, so let's, uh, we'll start with the dogs, underdogs perhaps. Uh, so I'll just go back to sharing my screen. So what would you like to go for first? You can choose any of those 25 tiles. They're all up for grabs. Obviously once one has been used, you can't use it again. Um, so physics 300? Physics 300 for the dogs under Trang. Okay. So uh, what has the higher frequency range? A vampire bat or a curvy linear low frequency ultrasound probe? So feel free to advise your captain Trang. All right, team. The chat, or just unmute yourself and call out. And you've got about ten seconds to make your answer. I think it's a bad, but what do you say, team? Come on, dogs, help out your captain. I think bat too. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay, going with bats. Yep. Let's see. The correct answer is the low frequency probe, I'm afraid. Gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> humans can hear up to about 20 kilohertz. Uh, so, everything above that is called ultrasound. Uh, vampire bats can hear higher than humans, up to about 100 kilohertz. Uh, but a low frequency ultrasound probe uh, goes up to 20 times that. So, up to 2000 kilohertz or 2 megahertz. Okay. So, let's go back to the board. And Varun, would you like to choose a tile for your team of cats? Uh, abdomen, 300. Abdomen for 300. Okay. What is the anechoic structure at the superior pole of this kidney? Abdominal cyst. Cyst, excellent. Yep, well done. So that is, well, yeah, yeah, simple cyst. Uh, so simple cysts are very common, especially in older people. Uh, and the definition of a simple cyst is one that is round, thin-walled, and doesn't have any internal septations or echoes. And there's also a phenomenon called uh, post-cystic enhancement. So the area behind the cyst here is brighter than the adjacent areas. That's typical of just a normal cyst. So simple cysts don't require any follow-up. No. Uh, but you know, in general, with incidental findings, if you're in any doubt, then just arrange an outpatient scan. Okay. okay, so we're back to Trang and the dogs. The cats are winning $300 to nil. So, <coughs> you can gamble for a high amount or play it safe. What do you think? Uh, procedure 300. Procedures for 300. Okay. So, the procedure shown here is a serratus anterior block. But what is the scoring system that helps predict the risk of complications in frail patients with rib fractures? The stumble. What was that, sorry? Stumble. Stumble. Stumble score. Excellent work. Very good. Yes. Amazing. Good what is the stumble score. Well done, dogs. So here is the stumble score. Uh, it's becoming more uh, more commonly used in UK hospitals. Quite a few departments now are using it for patients with rib fractures uh, to help guide decisions about whether they might need a nerve block, such as a serratus anterior block, and even whether they need admission. 
Uh, and it's a composite score based on five factors, your age, uh, uh, if you've got chronic lung disease, if you're on anticoagulation, uh, but also you get a uh, three points for each rib fracture. So you can imagine an older person with multiple rib fractures will have a high score. And so therefore will have a high risk of complications, uh, which should sort of prompt us to consider, do they need a nerve block? Do they need admission? Also okay. called the battle score, is it? Yeah, so it was originally the called the battle score, which uh, is named after the author of that original score, Kerry Battle from Wales, rather than it being sort of an injury that you get in battle. Uh, but I think now, stumble, I think her, her most recent publication, she calls it the stumble score. So it's the same thing. Okay, well done, uh, dogs. And you're keeping track of the score as well there, are you, Gokul? I think it's now yes, the, $300 each, but the cats have a, a turn. I have a question, yeah. A question in hand. Okay, what would you like to go for next, Varun and the cats? Uh, I think uh, we'll go for Thorax 500. Thorax 500, oh, confident. Okay, let's see. Okay, uh, what is the specific phenomenon that you can see within the consolidated lung shown here? So just to orientate you, the head is to the left of screen, feet to the right of screen. This is the diaphragm here, this bright white line. This is consolidated lung here. And we can see something going on within that lung. What is it called? Any cats want to help out you, Captain? Dynamic air bronchus. Oh, amazing. Was that Benaz? Yeah. I didn't know you were a cat lady yet. That's exactly <laughs> correct. Well done. They are dynamic air bronchograms. So when you see a little column of air moving up and down within the lung, uh, this is what Daniel Lichtenstein, the father of lung ultrasound, describes as a dynamic air bronchogram. Uh, and this is more specific to consolidation than something like compressive atelectasis. So if you see that, it's more likely to be infectious. infectious. Okay, I think we're back to the dogs. So there's a few tiles not available now, but you'll just have to remember what they are. What would you like to go for next? Does anybody else want to choose any? Anything? Yeah, sure, yeah, feel free to take advice from your team. We're gonna go high to try and catch up with the cats. They're a bit ahead now, I think 800 to 300, is it now for the cats? 800 to cats, 300 to yeah. the dogs. Might be worth going for another 500. What's your special subject though? Let's go 500 abdomen. 500 abdomen, okay. So what is the structure uh, here within the gallbladder? What is that? It looks like a polyp to me, but what do you say, team? Not sure, to be honest. I would go with your instinct train. <laughs> yeah, let's go with polyp. Excellent work. Well done, that is a gallbladder polyp. Uh, and we know it's a polyp and not a stone for two reasons. Uh, one, because it's hanging from the anterior wall whereas a stone will fall to the most sort of gravitationally dependent part of the gallbladder. Uh, and secondly, because it's not causing any shadowing. Uh, so that is a polyp, uh, which are usually benign, uh, but they do actually require follow-up. So if you do see one of these while you're scanning, uh, you should just pop in the GP letter that they should arrange an outpatient scan because they do actually need follow-up. Okay, well done. The dogs are back in town. I think 800 all. So it's the cats up next, Varun. I think the team can see this, man. What would you like to go for next, Varun? I think abdomen 400. Abdomen 400, okay. Okay, so what are these structures seen here within the liver? So this is the head at this end, feet at this end. You can see a bit of diaphragm here. This is the gallbladder, uh, this is the liver, and what are these structures within it? Feel free to give your captain some support. Yep. Looks like metastasis probably, what do you think, team? Yeah, I think it's METS. Excellent work. They are indeed metastases. Uh, so these are classically described as being like leopard spots. So sort of bright or echogenic inner region with a darker uh, or hypoechoic outer region. 
uh, and of sort of variable size. So there, that's the classic appearance of liver mets. Well done, another 400 for the cats. Okay, I think we've got enough time for maybe a couple more each. Uh, so what would you like to go for next, dogs? You're 400 behind now. Is that right, Gokul? Yeah, just a reminder, the cats are leading by 1,200 versus 800 yeah. dogs. Okay. Yeah. Can I just voice my objection that no one's gone for heart? <laughs> okay, let's go for heart this time then. What do oh. you say, team? Which one should we go for? 500 is good, yeah? Ooh. <laughs> let's go for Fine. Is that 500 heart, is it? Yep. 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 Cool. Okay. Uh, what is the main abnormality seen here? So this is the parasternal short axis view that we we saw a similar view in Gokul's case. So this is the left atrium uh, at the bottom. This is the interatrial septum. This is the right atrium tricuspid valve. You just see a bit of there, uh, and the right ventricle. So the right side of the heart is wrapped around the anterior aspect here. Uh, and if we just altered the probe a little bit, we might see the pulmonary artery coming out just here, which uh, where we saw the saddle embolus in Gokul's case. But what is the Looks main- Looks like a bicuspid aortic wall. We're going for bicuspid aortic valve, yeah. Anyone else from the team wanna hone that answer at all? I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you, yeah. I mean. The answer I had was actually aortic stenosis, but yeah, it does actually look kind of like a bicuspid valve there because you can only actually see two of the cups moving because the third cusp is so stenotic. So yeah, actually from that view, yeah, it could well be a bicuspid aortic valve. But you identified the, the pathology that is an, an abnormal aortic valve, which is the main thing. So I'll give you that one. Uh, so yeah, as I said, that's the parasonal short axis with the probe fanned up towards the base of the heart. And I think a lot of echo is just knowing what normal looks like. And if you'd seen a lot of normal aortic valves, I think you'd immediately identify that one is not moving normally. Uh, and so you don't have to necessarily be able to uh, quantify how bad it is. I think just being able to identify that's not normal uh, is already fantastic. Okay, so I think we're back to the cats. What would you like to go for next, Varun and team? Is this the last question we're doing? Yeah, how many rounds have we had so far? It's four rounds, right? Four, yeah. Okay. And the cats uh, are... Cats have the fourth question. So each team has had four questions. So dogs have completed four questions and the cats have done three questions. Okay. So, and the cats are winning by, so what's the score? At the, at the, at the moment, the dogs are leading by 100. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we just need 200 then. Okay, let's take <laughs> this the last question. So Anna's got enough time for her bit. So yeah, this is the last question. So the cats, so dogs are winning, but the cats need to score 200 to win or 100 to draw. What would you like to go for, cats? Or a 500 to show off. Yeah, if you want to just really rub it in the dog's face, you could go for 500. That would be, that would be a pretty cool. Uh, I would just go with 300 hard. Okay. A little bit of uh, rubbing in the face, but still playing it safe. I like it. Okay, 300 hard. Uh, so what is the main abnormality seen here? So this is the parasternal short axis view. Here's the right ventricle, here's the left ventricle. What is the main abnormality? So I'll give you about five more seconds to come with, with the answer. Feel free to give your captain some support. Come on, team. D sign and the thrombus in right ventricle. Yeah, is that your final answer? Yeah, we'll go with that one. D sign, yeah, well done, excellent. I think the stuff you're seeing in the right ventricle there may just be uh, some bits, bits of valve coming in and out. But yeah, the main abnormality was the RV dilation and the septal flattening, also known as the D sign, uh, which we saw also in Gokul's case. So well done for remembering that. Uh, yeah, so if you saw that in a young patient with a good story for a PE, I think you can, if they're unstable, you can just thrombolize them. Uh, whereas if you saw that in an older patient or a patient with lung disease, that could well be chronic. And so then you'd need to look for other 
science like DBT, or ideally just get them a CTPA. Okay, well done. So can we have the final scores uh, to, to solve? So the final scores hmm. is uh, the cats got all of their questions correct. Um, the dogs are on 1300 and the cats are 1500. Well done, cats. So I think we've, uh, we've finally just uh, settled the age old dispute. Cats are actually better than dogs. I'm sorry, Anna, but it's official. <laughs> And on that happy note to the dog loving Anna, I would like to hand over for a couple more case presentations. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm a cog. Oh, cats as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you just enable screen sharing for me? Yes, sure. Yeah, Thank done. you. And just while you're getting that up, uh, so Anna, as, as well as being an emergency medicine consultant at Lewisham Hospital, has also done a master's in ECHO. So what she doesn't know about ECHO is really not worth knowing about. Oh, and sure. may I say you're looking beautiful and glowing today, Anna. Yeah, well, what's on my face? <laughs> um, Okie doke. So sorry, I'm just going to very quickly get my screen share up. Cool. Everyone see something that says echo cases? Yep. Well, okay. So um, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed that game. That's that's great fun. Can I do the rest of the board on my own? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so just a couple of, of quick cases. They are echo cases. Um, so it is a bit interactive, sorry. This one, um, sorry, you can't see the top of that, but it's this um, female in her 40s. So this one was set, sent down from A&E x-ray, so a well outpatient x-ray, um, because as you can see, it's quite abnormal. Um, so on questioning, she'd had uh, several months of getting more short of breath. And uh, that's about it, really. No chest pain, no weight less, loss, no night sweats or anything like that. Um, no sort of cardiac or heart failure symptoms of um, uh, PND or orthopnea. Um, and she could speak quite comfortably. Um, the only thing on her examination was that she was just was borderline tachycardic. I think it was somewhere between 96 and 100. But blood pressure was fine. She was chatting away. Sats were fine. And she looked well. Um, so what are people's thoughts so far just um, on that chest x-ray? I welcome actual voices as well as chats, but I don't prefer voices. Tuberculosis. Yeah, so uh, you're thinking sort of um, Millery TB. Millery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what about the heart? Yeah, there's a heart, right heart enlargement. It looks kind of blobby, um, which was what they were concerned about. So it's quite a globular heart. Um, so it was referred to the medical team and they, they were wondering whether there was an effusion there and they just wanted to explore that because of um, the breathlessness. So, um, it, you know, pericardial effusion could technically be muddying the waters a little bit. Um, so, you know, having a, a reason to do the echo, we, we went and, and did it. Um, so firstly, which view is this? We've got our sort of focused um, cardiac view. So that'll be a parasitic long axis, short axis and apicals and the subcostal. So what is this view? Long axis. Peristernal long axis view. Brilliant. And um, what can we see that's abnormal on that view? Pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion, yeah. Pericardial effusion. Now, how can I tell that it's pericardial and not plural? The descending aorta. Uh, the descending aorta lies below the effusion. Real. Um, so, yeah, the descending aorta, I think you can see my arrow there. Is this... Um, uh, round structure just below the left atrium there and the pericardial effusion will come up to a point just above it whereas a pleural effusion it can look quite deceptive it will be up against that left ventricle but it will drop down below it so usually comes to about halfway up and drop down below so we know that's pericardial do we think that's a pretty big one do we think that's a, a small one what do we think seems pretty big a big one looks big um is there anything else just on first glance at that um that makes us worried about that pericardial effusion? RV is very small. It's like it's getting pressed and thinking tamponade. 
Yeah, so it's been, um, it, so if you can look at here, it's um, sort of being pushed in every now and then. Now the key with this is, is to make sure that's um, what phase of the cycle if that, uh, that's in. So if it's in systole, I'm not quite so excited. If it's, you know, meant to be small and it gets a bit smaller, that doesn't matter. But if it's trying to fill up in diastole and it's being compressed, that's an issue. Um, a good rule of thumb in terms of size is the RVOT, so this bit here, is supposed to be roughly at a one to one to one ratio with the um, aortic root, which is this bit in the middle there and the left atrium. And I'd say, you know, depending on, on the phase of the cycle, it, it looks roughly the same size. So I think that's OK. And um, the pericardial effusion is, is biggish. I mean, it's already kind of approaching the size of that left atrium. So that's quite worrying. Just to put it into context, most of the time we worry about them when they're more than two centimetres when we see them in the um, echo lab. Now, they can cause problems a bit sooner than that if uh, if it's accumulated really quickly, like from trauma. Um, but if it's accumulated over time, as this one would have been, um, it would really need to be over two centimetres to cause some problems. So we're going to crack on and have a look at some other views. So what view is this one? Parasitic long axis, short axis, apicals or subcostal? Short axis. Short axis. Short axis, yeah. So we've rotated the probe 90 degrees and um, it's a bit difficult to see on this view because it's just a recording on the screen. But what level have we come in at? So this is a cross section view of the heart and we tend to do aortic level, a mitral valve level, papillary muscle or, or near the apex. What, what level do you think we're in at there? Mitral valve. Mitral. Yeah. What was that? What was the second person? Mitral valve or? So these little guys, I don't know if you can see where my arrows are, um, are papillary muscles. They're, they're little um, crab claws, but I think, you know, it looks very similar to the mitral valve when it's moving this fast. Um, so uh, papillary muscle or mitral valve level. Um, so, and again, we've got this big effusion. Now I can say, talk about the distribution of it as well. So um, what, how could you describe the distribution of that pericardial effusion? You don't have to have a clever answer. Circumferential, yeah. So anything that makes sense. So global circumferential um, distribution matters because uh, firstly, it, it, you want to know whether you can drain it and um, it, it can cause more problems with it's more around the um, RV. Um, sometimes it is just um, going to be bigger to do with gravity. And when it's big like this all around, then there's just quite a lot of fluid. It's probably under a little bit of tension as well. Um, so that's um, important to know. And again, we're seeing this um, RV bouncing away, um, which is a bit worrying. So it's collapsing a little bit. OK, I'm going to have another look at the next view. So what view is this parasternal long axis, short axis, apical or subcostal? Subcostal. Subcostal, well done, 10 points. Um, and it looks even bigger here, if you can see. That, that looks like a really big pericardial effusion. And I think in this view, it's most obvious that that RV and right atrium are, are both suffering quite a bit with um, that fluid around it. So they both seem, to, so the RV doesn't seem to be filling at any point during that cycle. We're never seeing it um, big like we'd expect it. Um, so I think we, we, we need to look at that a bit closely. Um, so it's, what the conundrum here is, if you've got a patient who's well um, and clinical um, tamponade is um, a clinical diagnosis, so we can't really call this tamponade unless the patient's sick. Uh, so what we've got is something that, that looks quite worrying, but with a well patient in front of us. So, so what do you think we should do? You can do more views if you want to. Apical as well it looks you know, similar. You can check for IVC. Yeah, IVC. Okay, let's have a look. What are we expecting to see with the IVC? Maybe engorged and dilated, not compressible. Yeah, so if there's all this pressure on the right side of the heart, that pressure is going to need to back up into the IVC, and we'd expect um, it really not to show much respiratory variation at all. So here we've got our IVC. We've put a bit of M mode across it. And um, when the patient takes a breath in, we've got just a tiny bit of collapse there. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of collapse and it, it measures, um, it was less than 2.5 uh, centimetres, it was 2 point, um, uh, I think it was about 2.1 centimetres, then a bit of collapse and, and again she's well. So my report was, you know, I don't like the look of it, 
but patients well this is not clinically tamponade I did do some Doppler as well which we'll talk about a li- in a little um, minute uh, just to see if I could uh, reassure myself that there wasn't convincing uh, evidence of you know a complete uh, immediate or imposing tamponade um, but I had enough to tell the medic what I thought and just say you know probably discuss with the cardiologist um, today Uh, the measurement there was 3.21 centimeters so just measure at the widest point um, of the effusion and you might want to do it on different views get a few measurements and and, um, comment on the distribution so um, it was discussed with the cardiology center and uh, they were relatively concerned about the views as well so she was actually transferred across and when by the time she got there, she was more tachycardic. She was about 110. Her blood pressure was still okay, um, but they redid the echo, and she had a slightly bigger effusion by that point. She had a, 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 it was over four centimeter what they measured, um, and they she had more variability with her transmitral velocities, which I'll show you a picture of in a second. Um, when um, they decided to drain it that day and about 1.2 litres was drained off and oddly enough it wasn't miliary TB it was a disseminated malignancy so this was a malignant um, effusion Um, so all very odd because no weight loss Um, she hadn't really had any symptoms but um, there was possibly a primary in the breast but there were also um, lesions found in the pelvis and so possible gynecological malignancy. So um, we did do a tamponade talk back in December and this QR code will um, take you to the YouTube channel where that's uploaded. Uh, our YouTube channel, the POCUS collaboration, is available as a few videos on there. We try and keep, keep um, up with them. So just for those um, who haven't done too many of the pericardial effusion echoes, this is what we were talking about. So the thoracic aorta or the descending aorta forms our landmark on the parasternal long axis view. And a pericardial effusion, which we see in blue, will come up to a point above that. A pleural effusion will drop down below. So here they are, here are a couple just um, side by side to compare it. So you can see the pericardial effusion on the left coming up to a point above um, the thoracic aorta sort of in the atrioventricular groove and then the pleural effusion drops down below and sometimes you can you can have a bit of both um, but um, here you can see the difference quite nicely and as I said it really should you need to have an unwell patient to to call it tamponade and start sticking needles in them straight away so um, this patient you know certainly needed discussion it was quite a worrying echo and, and the plan would be for her to be um, you know electively drained Um, And uh, as it happened, she did deteriorate and um, there was more of a clinical picture of um, of a hemodynamically unstable tamponade patient. So what questions do we ask when we have a look at um, a pericardial effusion? So firstly, we have to check that it's not plural pericardial. So this is um, an example of where there are both. So thoracic aorta there, this is our left atrium here. And then here there's a pericardial effusion coming up above the thoracic aorta. And there's also a pleural, so there's both in this image. Look at the size, they do make an effort to try and measure um, at some places uh, how big it is. Like I say, over two centimeters tends to be significant. Um, But um, if you see anything above a a few mils, you know, there's probably is a pericardial effusion rather than just physiological fluids. And um, you can write to the GP and say they're they're likely to need that watching. Um, Lots of people do have a trace of fluid that's visible on um, on ultrasound. So um, obviously the pericardial sac needs to slide around, a heart needs to slide around in the pericardial sac. So people have that to different in. Extents, and we d- didn't tend to worry about them when they were less than one centimeter, um, and they didn't necessarily need uh, annual surveillance with that. But do let the GP know the distributions. As I said before, if it's um, more around the lower pressure areas of the heart, it's got more um, potential and um, to be problematic. Um, and we're looking for diastolic free wall collapse of the um, right ventricle, um, but the systolic right atrial collapse is supposed to be quite a sensitive early sign um, of impending tamponade. Um, And there's going to be exaggerated respiratory cycle, a bit like the pulses paradoxus you'll see on the ECG trace. A similar finding is um, found on the echo with pulse wave Doppler. And then we look at the IVC to check that it's dilated and it's not got that respiratory variation because that's um, 
that's going to change our management. And we need to decide whether we think we can drain it percutaneously. So we'd hope that the effusion is quite big anteriorly um, and that we could get um, you know, uh, into an effusion that's more than two centimetres there. So this one is, is certainly not drainable. Not that you would go for that one. That looks like quite a happy heart with its fluid around. So this is the um, transmitral, trans tricuspid velocities that I was talking about. This is using pulse wave Doppler. And um, the difference between pulse wave and um, continuous date wave Doppler. So firstly, continuous wave um, is only really used um, for the higher velocity uh, waveforms like aortic stenosis in the heart. And pulse wave is looking to um, find the velocity at a specific point in the heart. So you'll find on the pulse wave line, there's a little equal sign, which is um, the sample volume. So that's the point at which the um, velocity is going to be measured. So this is placed just above the valve. So just above the mitral valve on the left side of the heart. And then what we need to do is need to get lots of these complexes within one um, view on our ultrasound machine. So we need to increase the speed of this trace. And quite often that's called the sweep speed. So we just um, jack that speed up as much as we can until we have lots of these um, um, Doppler envelopes on one image. And as they take a breath in and a breath out, uh, we look at that variation. And then we take um, the uh, measurement at the first breath of expiration and compare it to the um, measurement of the first um, part of inspiration. And we're looking for a variation of more than 25%. You can also do it on the uh, tricuspid side. There the increase or the, the change needs to be more than 40%. And typically we tend to do it on the mitral side. So that's what I found when I did it um, while she was well. So we didn't quite have um, 25%. Um, and that became more pronounced when she was seen at the um, cardiology centre. So case two, we've got um, a male in his 50s. He's uh, got a history of hypertension, but it's quite fit and well, actually. Sudden onset, chest pain, whilst walking the dog that morning, and he was brought in by ambulance query ACS. Um, he, he was in quite a lot of pain and seemed quite on well, but they didn't take him to a PCI because he had an ECG that only showed a single isolated T-wave inversion in lead three. By the time we got to us, he was a bit sweaty. And then when we did his blood pressure, it was only 40 systolic and he was tachycardic at 140, but it wasn't arrhythmia, it was just sinus tachy. Um, so he's in resus, um, he's got some access in. Uh, what do we do next? So firstly, what's going through your mind in terms of differentials? The section. The section, yeah. The section of what? Sorry, I should be more specific. That's rule R3. Aortic dissection. Here was it, dissection. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it could be abdominal aortic, it could be thoracic aortic dissection. Um, what else could be causing? I mean, he's shocked, isn't he? So, what else could be causing his shock with that history? Uh, pulmonary embolism. Yeah, PE. Or you know, he has had um, a big MRI, and maybe he's um, uh, maybe he's in cardiogenic shock, and they've got a dodgy trace. I don't know. So uh, we're sort of trying to refine what the causes of shock are here. Um, so what are our next sessions? I mean, obviously we're going to resuscitate this gentleman. He's very hypotensive. That's his gas there. He was pretty poorly. Um, so the HB was fine, one four six. Uh, his lactate though was seven point eight, and he was quite acidotic. Um, 7.22 and uh, he had a bicarb of 16 at that point. So what role does POCUS play in this patient? You can differentiate the shock. You can use it to do like a rush protocol. Yeah, so we're a bit stuck with this one. I mean, you've already mentioned dissection, and that um, seems like a, a good one to certainly rule out. Um, but he's not really well enough to get through a CT scanner at the moment. Um, and we need to know whether we can pour just fluids into it, him or if we're going to be starting presses. So um, does anyone know of any protocols we might use in the, in the undifferentiated shock patient? How would we decide... Uh, how best to treat our shock or what kind of shock it is. Rush protocols. 
rush protocol yet and sometimes it's called HIMAP protocol um, so these are using a, a composite of different POCUS methods to rule in or rule out different types of um, uh, causes of shock so uh, it's really very focused scans um, a quick echo uh, having a look to see what, what the heart is doing so is this a pump failure is the right heart massively dilated um, is there um, a big pericardial effusion again um, so and then we were going to move on to the tank the lungs the abdomen is there a load of fluid, free fluid in the abdomen have they ruptured in the aorta uh, have they dissected um have they got uh fluid from um third spacing and have they got fluid on the chest so they got evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary edema and sometimes you can see a pneumonia in there um, is it distributive shock from um sepsis um, and we can slide down the aorta and have a look to see if we've got a big aortic aneurysm that might give us some clues. Um, and we can also look for attention pneumothorax. So in a few minutes, we can have suddenly uh, have a lot stronger uh, indication of whether our thoughts, our, our diagnosis in our head is more likely or less likely. So um, a quick uh, rush protocol would be um, a good part of your primary survey in this patient. Um, if you have the time, we can do it at the end of your primary survey. So which image is this? Parasternal long axis, short axis, or subcostal? Long axis. Long axis. I'll give you a clue. The order is always long axis, <laughs> short axis. Um, but um, can anyone already see any abnormalities on this parasternal long axis view of this patient? Dilated aortic root. Yes, um, so the aortic root is this bit here. Now, if you remember, I said quite a good rule of thumb is that the right ventricle outflow tract and the aortic root and the left atrium are roughly a one to one to one ratio. And it looks like this aorta is probably about twice the size of those other two regions. So that's already concerning. Any other abnormalities on this echo? There's probably a couple more in terms of like focused echoes that you can comment on. There's some fluid. There's some fluid, yeah. So more obvious around that right ventricle outflow there at the top. There's some black fluid there. You can see a little sliver around there. Anything else? There's something in the fluid that's like flapping. Up here? Yeah. Possibly and also the LV. LB is like completely hyperdynamic. Yeah, so um, one of the questions we're asking is this pump failure. So this for LV is certainly moving, it's working quite hard. So we, we're more in the hypovolemia um, camp rather than a pump failure camp. So we're already refining our differentials there. What about that RVOT? We were talking about tamponade earlier on. What do you make of that RVOT? It's barely open barely opening and it's been compressed quite a bit by that fluid so um i'd say yeah it's still it's still um opening a bit um in diastole but that's that's not looking great so let's have a look at some other views which view is this short axis at aortic aortic wall yeah so this is it's a parasomal short axis view. Our aortic valve level is here, so we can see the Mercedes Benz sign here. And around the top, we've got our right side of the heart, so the right, right outflow tract again, the tricuspid valve there. Um, and this is the right atrium down here, and this is the left atrium down there, and then our thoracic aorta. It's just, it's not very clear, but it's down here. Um, so with the eye of faith, you might see that there's a bit of echogenic material just above this RVOT. I don't know if you can see that there. You'd be forgiven to think that's artifact. You know, it's not very clear there, but that's already a little bit odd. Does anyone think what, can anyone think what that might be? Blood like clot? Yeah, so it did make us think that maybe there was a bit of clot there. Another reason to closely look at this one is we've seen this big dilated aorta, which incidentally measured 5.1 centimetres. Um, on the parasternal long axis view. So what might we be looking for in our other views of the aorta or in that view? Indeed. So you can get dilated aortas from chronic hypertension 
in this context of this history it, with sudden onset chest pain we are thinking about dissection type a dissection and if we can find a dissection flap that can really help our cause unfortunately with, as hard as i tried i couldn't find a convincing dissection flap anywhere um which was a shame so we'll have a look at another view what do we think of this one what view is it first of all slightly dodgy one but what view is it Apical. apical four chamber yeah apical four sometimes five chamber views we've got a bit of aortic valve in the middle there um that echogenic material in the effusion is a bit more prominent here and i think this is the view where it was most obvious so that bit that you saw flapping around in the um uh, parasternal long axis view that's visible there and we've got what looks like a kind of solid mass of echogenic material rocking in that effusion so that looks much more convincing for a clot again we're looking at this rv and it's collapsing so and it's swinging quite a lot in that fluid so this is starting to look much more like tamponade and now we've got a patient in front of us who is shocked who is clinically unwell so that that fits and we've got echo, um, echocardiographic evidence of tamponade um, so that is quite concerning. I don't really fancy draining this because I don't think there'll be an end to the tap. Um, so I really like to get him to a centre. And fortunately, after a bit of toing and throwing, they accepted the patient just on the base of the pocus. They weren't delighted by it, um, but they did take it because we only got his blood pressure up to about 60 systolic with them, um, three litres and um, some blood. Um, so something? yes, of course. Did, did you also do a, a supersternal view, and did that result in anything? I didn't. I didn't even do, um, a, a, you know, a full um, study with the echo because he really was quite poorly. Yeah, uh, so yeah. It would have been nice to find the echo flap, but I don't think that would change anything. You've got someone who's got, got a large pericardial effusion, a wide media, um, you know, I mean, a wide aortic route, and I've seen clot in there. That's yeah. enough for me to think. If they'd sent me back saying, I'm definitely not taking that until we find a flat, I would try a bit harder, but I'd always say right to their consultant. Um, so uh, it was a type A dissection. I went in the ambulance with them with some sort of makeshift needle kit um, involving an abacaf. Um, and he stayed stable. He actually, his blood pressure came up a bit and he was well enough to go through a CT scanner when he was um, at the vascular centre. Um, which confirmed the aortic dissection. In incidentally, the um, cardiologist who did the echo there found exactly the same diameter of aortic root and also couldn't find a dissection flap. Um, they took it to theatre, um, and this was the finding on the CT. So again, 5.1 millimetres, that's exactly what we measured uh, on both the echoes. You can see this little dissection flap there. So this is all within the same three centimetre section of ascending aorta. Um, and there was um, aortic regurg as well on the um, parasternal long axis view, which happens when you have that dilated aortic route. So good outcome for him. He um, was actually discharged from hospital yesterday. So that was about th three and a half weeks after this incident. So that was a really good outcome. Um, and um, I don't think we would have done very well if we kept him at our very capable, but very limited hospital um, at Lewisham. So um, that was a nice case where POCUS changed our management and uh, also uh, allowed us to transfer to, for definitive management. Really the, the key there was that there was cardiographic findings and the clinical findings of tamponade. And that was the key why he was transferred without the scan. I think they would have pushed very, very hard for us to get him through a scanner if that hadn't been there. Um, so if you have someone and it's not there, just do your serial imaging and make sure you're not um, you're not missing an impending tamponade. Any questions on that last one before I wrap up with my final two gripping cases? Well, that was fantastic. Sorry? I'm just thinking maybe because we're a little bit over time, um, maybe we could save the other cases for another time I don't they're, they're two minute cases these okay, are both just normal yeah. variants i just wanted to make you aware of oh, sure. okay. so um firstly this one it, they, i don't know if you can see there's just a little movement in that right atrium there um uh sort of looks like a little filament has anyone ever seen anything like that okay Gokul, what's that i've seen once it's the 
I'm, I'm confused between the two things. U Station Valve and the Chiari Network. Yes, yeah, so it's not U Station yeah. Valve. It's um, it's Chiari Network. Chiari Network. Yeah. Chiari Network. Um, if you're going to cut them open, it has this um, fibrous uh, network which is sort of attaches to where the IVC joins the right atrium. Um, and um, it, it really has no clinical significance, really. Uh, technically, it can cause, it's really a theoretical uh, thing, but it can cause um, a slightly, uh, a bit of uh, thromboembolism um, propensity because of flow obstruction. It can stop you getting your guide wires through for procedures, um, but it, it's very much an incidental finding. It can, it can look a little bit scary when you first see it. Um, and the other one is this one. So this was uh, one of our nurses who volunteered for an echo just to practice echo. Um, and he said, oh, actually, I think I've been a bit short of breath. I quite like to have an echo anyway, and then threw himself on the bed. Um, so we've got this uh, little, I want to call it a nubbin. I don't think that's a, a medical word, but let's call it a nubbin in the left atrium. Does anyone know what that might be? Atrial myxoma. Sorry, I missed that. Atrial myxoma, maybe? Atrial myxoma. So um, that's one of the differentials. It's not, it's something that's quite innocent. Um, any other thoughts? Um, so it's often mistaken for a clot. It's often mistaken for an atrial myxoma. What it actually is is something called a Kumardin ridge. Does that ring a bell for anyone? It only rang up a bell for me for, with textbooks and I had to remind myself. But um, essentially it's, it's right where the, the left atrial appendage joins. And um, the reason it's called a Kumardin ridge is because it was uh, traditionally um, mistaken for clots um, and people were accidentally warfarinized for no good reason. So um, it is a normal variant, it's completely innocent. Um, there's an article on it here if you scan the QR um, code. Uh, so often diagnosed as a false thrombus and um, people received unnecessary anticoagulation therapy with Kumardin, hence Kumardin Ridge. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, just a ridge of tissue that separates the left atrial appendage from the, um, uh, from the left superior pulmonary vein. And in general, the proximal part is thin and the distal tip can be wider protruding into the atrium. So we had a very typical appearance there. So it looks a bit like a tumor, like an atrial exoma. Um, um, and it's actually um, one of the components is the ligament or marshal, which is a remnant of the left superior vena cava. Um, so the ridge has quite muscular connections with the left superior pulmonary vein. And um, it can cause a bit cause a propensity to focal um, atrial fibrillation, and so it becomes a potential site for ablation. Um, so that's really the only um, kind of clinical application for it. So when you see it, you just you need to look for that typical morphology of it being like quite thin near the base and a bit more bulbous and um, right at that typical place where the left um, atrial appendage is um, to avoid unnecessary treatments and interventions. And obviously, if you've got a history, that's more um, that could be um, in keeping with a thrombus or something like that, then you'd have to get it explored further. Um, but we did see these. Um, uh, not myself actually, but my my colleagues did see these in the echo department quite a lot, and um, they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't have any regular surveillance or anything like that. It was just a normal variant. Okay, that's it. Amazing. Thanks very much for Anna. That was fantastic. Uh, awesome. Think, uh, Thank you. Yeah, I think those first two cases really uh, demonstrate an important part of the tamponade physiology as well. With the first case, the kind of slow growing pericardial effusion from an underlying malignancy that was fairly well tolerated, even though it was fairly large. And then the second case with the, the dissection causing a sudden, um, a sudden pericardial effusion and the fibrous pericardium didn't have any time to stretch. So even a relatively small volume was actually, uh, actually compromised the patient quite severely. So fantastic. Uh, yeah, because we're a bit over time, perhaps, uh, yeah, if there's any burning questions for Anna. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, so uh, Anna, are there any um, adaptations of the heart to um, longer existing pericardial effusions. I think you're still on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the beginning bit of that question. Any yeah, what so, that? so if you have a patient who, for instance, has a pericardial effusion due to a malignancy and it's been a long-standing problem and it eventually uh, shows up, have there been any 
adaptations in the meantime? Do you see any? Oh, any... Yeah, yeah, as in, yeah. Um, yeah, moderate. So yes, the older there are, the more likely to, you're going to have some um, uh, some echogenic material in there. You can have some fibrin strands in there. And the typical pericardial effusions with fibrin strands are um, TB ones, actually. Um, but um, but yes, uh, older ones, a bit like old um, pleural effusions, you're, you're more likely to have some debris in there. Yeah, and does that right ventricle change in any way? Um, oh, as in um, remodeling? No, I haven't really seen that. I don't know. Tim Horat Harris is um, right ventricle man um, in my book, but I haven't seen any remodeling of the right ventricle due to um, palm uh, a, a, um, a fusion um, because it's it maintains its pressure. That pericardium gradually stretches and it just accommodates. So really, it has, doesn't have any effect on the um, right ventricle. All right. Cool. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, excuse me, can I have a question, please? Yes. I'm Dr. Siddiqui. Um, um, can I ask Anna, uh, what is your message to the, our young doctors if they see pericardial effusion or, te or tamponade on the echo and you're the district hospital, you're not the tertiary hospital. So as you say that uh, cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis, and how much time you have um, to be drained in the tertiary center rather than a district hospital? So I think we, we do have the ability to talk to our specialists and, and I, I'm quite liberal with WhatsApping with images to the specialists. If you've got someone who's peri-arrest um, in front of you due to um, a large pericardial um, effusion, uh, sorry, yeah, pericardial effusion. And the only example I can think of is the TB one that I had. Um, we, you know, we, we do go ahead and drain those like, as you would. I wouldn't be throwing needles into someone who's got a dissection because there's there's probably a tap that you're not going to be able to turn off. Um, but if you're confident that you've got um, a medical cause for it um, and they are really quite unwell in front of you and they're not going to survive a transfer, of course, go ahead and um, percutaneously drain it. And you can uh, see a bit more about that on that um, tamponade video that's on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Great wheel. Thanks again, Anna, for that fantastic presentation. And thank you, Gokul. And yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, if you're not already aware of the Slack group, that's the group by which we organize these meetings. And there's also some other fantastic information up there. There's basically channels with uh, lots of useful resources on lots of different uh, focus topics. I'll just pop the joining link into the chat here in case you're not already in the group. Uh, and stay tuned on that site for the next session, which will be next month uh, with Ashley Matties from uh, Homerton. And then in May, myself and Gokul may do another session on the kidney. Uh, we're hoping to try and keep these going every month. Uh, so please spread the word about the group. Uh, feel free to, to send the link to anyone uh, in your departments or beyond interested in POCUS. Thanks. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Night-night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.